reduced it so that we got our HKA to the appropriate angle. So her fixator was locked at 185 and therefore, and this is the uh, picture at the end of uh, maybe after the fixator was removed, you can see all of that has healed because of the gradual distraction and the bone that is formed. But the important thing here is that the net distraction was only 17 days when as per the plan in terms of Miniachi, etc., uh, this was uh, 21 days or X amount of millimeters. So we really in this particular situation, if we had only used the plate again, as per the planning, we would have um, landed up with over um, distraction. So in conclusion, for me, the fixator really allows a lot of post-operative um, fine tuning in the weight bearing position. And this to me is even more important. The younger the patient, the more important uh, this is to get that angle uh, just right. Because I don't want to, certainly don't want to make a mistake in under correction, but over correction also patients are not very uh, happy. And especially when there is a significant JLCA, that will tend to throw off your uh, calculations a fair bit. I do use the Tomofix in the remaining 20% of the cases, but these are usually uh, older patients or where the patients, in addition to the correction of varus valgus, they need a slope correction also because the Tomofix allows us to um, you know, take care of the slope. With the fixator, you cannot change uh, the slope. And in younger patients, where I'm doing it for deformity and not for medial compartment uh, osteoarthritis. Because in younger patients, even if you are slightly a couple of degrees undercorrected, it doesn't really make a difference. They are coming to get the limb um, straight. Whereas in medial compartment osteoarthritis, I think going a little bit at least on the lateral side is significant, is important to reduce the chance of under correction and recurrence of pain after, let us say, seven, eight, ten uh, years. So, if you get the angle right, I think the literature shows that that has the maximum uh, long term benefit. So, that's why um, in many of, in, in, in large majority of my cases, I still prefer to use a fixator uh, for the tibial correction rather than a tomofix. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mangal. Now we'll move to the next part, medial open with high tibial osteotomy. And let me just share my screen. You have stopped your screen. Yeah, I have stopped. Yes. My screen is visible. Visible, scrolling through all the slides. Right, actually. So now I'll talk on medial open with high TB loss chart with the ingenious stability implant that's tomophix. And because of the failure of could do plate because of instability, implant failure, slope increase in pseudoarthrosis, and the disadvantage of having external fixated with long wearing time, patient discomfort, uh, pain during distraction, and high rate of pin tract infection. The AO uh, group uh, in their knee preservation section, they developed a TOMO fix, which was started in 2000 and finally launched in 2012. The most commonly used was 
medial plate, which is medial tomophics, which is uh, used in 85% of the uh, cases because that's the most common deformity in osteoarthritis knee requiring correction. And it is not site um, specific, the same plate can be used on medial or lateral side. The stomophix is a biological internal fixator for metaphysio diffusial osteotomy around the knee joint. It is biological because it preserves the blood supply of bone and soft tissue vitality and provides biomechanical stability. It is based on sprinting principles, and that's the reason alternate load bearing and with a function rehab leads to micro motion and promotes bone healing. This is made of titanium because it's biomechanically and bio compatible. Now this fixator is a one stage internal spatial frame, which has four proximal and four distal locking head screws, and it has allowed opening up to 22 millimeter. And the reason is the, the distance between the hole B and D is three centimeters and the plate is put one centimeter from the joint line. So when the proximal fragment is four centimeters or more, this will have adequate purchase in the proximal part. And the distance between hole D and hole one is 26 millimeter. That means if we have an osteotomy gap of 22 millimeters, the purchase in hole D and hole one would be perfect. So the initial results of 700 cases were analyzed by AO expert group and they and concluded that the implant offers great potential for correction of both unipolar and multipolar deformities. It gave good results in revision surgeries and this did not depend on the bone graft in the osteotomy gap. The, the newer generation plate was introduced in 2011 and the same year later, a plate was introduced for Asian population and biomechanically they were identical. The Asian plate was such that it led to an anatomical fit of these small stature patients and the thickness of this plate is 3 mm. This must be remembered because when you put a locking head screw, they should be uh, perfectly placed to have perfect locking. And these screws are in the proximal part as oriented from anterior medial to posterior lateral. This is not rigid. It is on, based on bridging principle, and this plate should not be substituted by trauma plate of you know, AO because it is a rigid fixator. Now, the with the load bearing, there is distribution of forces in a larger area, and this plastic deformation of the plate takes place immediately, which allows micro motion. The whole A, B, C are inclined 10 degrees distally, and the whole D and whole 4 takes spacers, which is, th they are 3 mm, and these help us to preserve the blood supply. The whole B, A, B, C are aligned convergently to increase the stability and have a spring suspension of the lateral hinge and the proximal end of the plate should be placed as posterior as possible to have the largest possible locking head screws. The hold in the distal part are uh, arranged staggeredly, so the, no vertical or shear um, fissure fracture takes place in the tibia. This plate can be applied by minimal invasive um, procedure a wide exposure is not required by five to six millimeter oblique incision. It is sufficient to do the osteotomy and correct the, replace the fixator. And the distal partial portion is put by making a subcutaneous tunnel and the screws are locked with a small additional incision. This plate with the fixator 
is put over the osteotomy gap to provide more stability on the medial side and it is preserved the periosteum persistence and medial collateral ligament. When there is an intact hinge or even if when there is distraction, doing putting a screw which is distally directed towards the distal fragment immediately and the lateral hinge is compressed and this does not um, require any placement of plate on the lateral side as sometimes people think that it is needed. The hori is a 10 mm lateral bone block which is just proximal to the tibiofibular joint and it facilitates highest possible correction and the compression is achieved by a lag screw in hole one the way I have just shown. The implant has a improved osseous primary stability because the plate is placed medially. There is a bone contact behind the tibial tuberosity. On the laterally, the bone con uh, the hinge is already there. Posteriorly, the screws are direct posteriorly. So they support the posterior bond and the proximal block support is there because of there are four locking head screws in the proximal part. So this is the area where there's a bone contact even after the you know, osteotomy because of the biplanar nature of the osteotomy. Tomofix per se is very easy to handle if you understand the implant in the technique. It is user friendly and good reproducibility is there. The first 707 cases were analyzed where the VAS reduced from four to one and patient was full weight bearing without crutches on an average after 10 weeks. There was no neurological complication and only three patients acquired TKR because of the progressive degenerative disease and persistent pain. There was only one patient who was a narcotic addict who had delayed union, but this also united in 13 months time when the implant was removed in 15 months. So the take home message so far as the term of is concerned, there's a newer version is uh, Asian specific. It works on bridging principle, a correction of 22 millimeters is possible. No graft is required and it can be used even in presence of osteoporosis. Now moving on to the technique, when we do a medial open wedge high table osteotomy, the weight bearing line from medial side is passed on to the lateral side which is the normal. In the cartilage is normal, in the plane disappears, and the medial side heals. And the ideal implant, ideal patient for medial open with high TB osteotomy is a phys physically active patient. The physiological age could be any, even 70. The tibia vera is more than five, uh, proximal uh, tibia vera. Then this gives better results. The opposite compartment should be intact. A deformity, friction deformity up to 20 degrees can be corrected on table by doing this osteotomy. The patient might have certain amount of pain, so he should be tolerant to a VAS of one. ACL, PCL deficiency is not a contraindication. And obesity and smoking uh, is also not a contraindication because in presence, of this with uh, tomophics, patient can be operated and good results are achieved. It is only contraindicated when there is loss of lateral meniscus. The uh, cartilage damage on the lateral side is three or four. There is limited range of motion or the friction deformity is more than 20 degrees. If the soft tissues are in the proximity beyond the medial side are not good or if there is systemic and local inflammation. Per se, arthroscopy is not needed. It is only indicated when there is a mechanical issues because arthroscopy per se leads to deterioration of osteoarthritis knee. This osteotomy is biplanar. The anterior ascending osteotomy is a complete as seen by the uh, smaller saw blade and the uh, Transverse osteotomy is a uh, 
incomplete osteotomy, which is posteriorly. So this is the patient is operated in a supine position with lateral support and a foot pad, which is an allow easy positioning of a limb in 90 degree flexion in foot extension. The contralateral leg is lowered at the hip. The junction of the convex and the concave point on the medial border is the starting point of osteotomy, and it makes the osteotomy isosceles image just which I'll show you that later. The patient's landmarks are marked with the 90 degree knee flexion with the medial joint line, cranial border of press, medial collateral and medial velocity. It has been shown by anthropometric distance that the the press incidence is at a distance of four to six centimeters from the joint line. So this gives an enough area to put the proximal part of the plate. The skin incision has evolved with passage of time. Now we use a micro incision, which is five to six, just approximately the best. And it also avoids damage to the infracotical branch of the nerve. The incision runs from a point anterior to incision of press in a posterior cranial direction. After the skin incision, the fascia is and cleared, and then we raise a tissue of periosteal flap from the sartorius proximal to the osteoarthritis side, that means press and serenus, which is this laterally, and this helps to cover the osteoarthritis gap. So this is the flap which is being raised, and this is put under the osteoarthritis, uh, under the plate to cover the osteoarthritis. For further exposure, proximal border of press and is identified, and this is retracted through the. This is retracted through the. Press and sinus bursa, which is at a distance of four to six centimeters from the. Joint line. This is the medial collateral ligament, which is attached posteriorly on tibia. So if it is not raised, there is more opening on the anterior side leading to increase slope of the tibia. So it is essential to remove the medial collateral ligament. And for this, we retract the press and synonymous distally and raise this MCL to avoid knee pain on the medial side later. The osteotomy should be done by a a traumatic technique. The entire sewing procedure should be done slowly with minimal pressure under constant cooling to avoid thermal necrosis with new blades because that also helps to decrease the heat. These patients were subjected for uh, MRI. This is a T2 um, fat suppressed image. On the side of the osteotomy, this is the hematoma seen immediately after the osteotomy and there is no bone edema um, seen. That means there is no marrow edema. After three weeks, this is the new bone formation, hyperconnection tissue is seen. That means this is already started healing at three months time and uniting. The size of the hematoma is decreased and at six weeks, there's further increase in the new bone formation and the hematoma is further reduced. At this time at six weeks, that's what we say, patient can be mobilized without pain with some support. The transverse osteotomy is done uh, from the junction of convex and concave part on the medial side of tibia. And this is directed towards the lateral hinge. And this is the window where it should come. If it is above, then it goes into the joint, which is not, uh, not correct. And if it's below, it will lead to decrease correction because the fibula is there. The osteotomy should be parallel to the lateral tibial slope. And this is how it is uh, seen. And for this internal navigation of the slope, we pass a K wire in the one centimeter distal to the knee joint line in AP direction. And once we see this in the in a plane, when it is seen as a dot, 
then we pass two wires uh, from the uh, point of concave junction to just proximal to the proximal tibiofibular joint and the osteotomy is done under it. So this will be parallel to the uh, lateral slope of uh, tibia. So as I said, we pass one AP wire, one centimeter distal to the joint line and two wires parallel to the lateral tibia slope. The wires must go right up to the end in the lateral cortex, which should be seen in 30 degree internal rotation. And the osteotomy should be done in one shot um, to avoid damage uh, to the structures and vascularity of the bone and soft tissue. This is in 30 degree internal rotation. This is the place where the wire should reach outside the tibiofibular joint. The osteotomy will come below it. And this is on the table. This is the AP wire, and these are the two the transverse wire. This wire, which is one centimeter from the joint line, also helps to put the proximal end of the tomophics in the proper place. The, we hold the third wire outside these two protruding wires to know what is the depth of the osteotomy. This is measured and this is marked on the saw blade. This is the concept of transverse osteotomy, which is an incomplete osteotomy. As you can see in the posterior part, this interior part, in the posterior area is not cut. The protruding wires are cut to have the easy access for osteotomy. Transverse osteotomy should always be done with mean 90 degree flexion. The cutting depth is marked on a new bed, which is 0 0.9 mm thick, 20 mm wide, and 99, 90 mm long oscillating saw blade. The osteotomy should be done slowly under constant cooling. We must cut the hard posterior medial tibial cortex first, and the anatomical posterior structure is protected by the foment retractor, which is put anterior to the popliteus muscle to protect the neurovascular bundles. So this is the popliteus muscle, and this is the neuro uh, side of the osteotomy. The retractor, and uh, omen retractor is anterior to it. The lateral bony bridge is a, a hinge. It has micro fractures and the bone is not elastic. So if fracture, micro fractures take place, but if they enter the joint, it leads to instability and decreased impaired bone healing, which it becomes a problem and it takes more time for it to heal. The posterior cortex should be cut completely because if it's not cut completely, it leads to plateau fracture or unstable lateral hinge and increase in tibial slope. The ascending osteotomy is parallel to the anterior shin of the tibia at an angle of 110 to 130 degrees from the transverse osteotomy. It should end between the knee joint anteriorly and to the If the correction is more, we can have this tuberosity as thick as one third of the tibial width. So this is the ascending osteotomy here. It is parallel to the anterior cortex of tibial shaft. The osteotomy planes glide over each other. And this is the area uh, where the healing first takes place. So it should be as long as possible, should not enter to the knee, uh, joint or below the tuberosity. So this is the window from where we can have the uh, ascending osteotomy. Ascending osteotomy is a complete osteotomy and it is acts as a wall against dorsal translation of the distal fragment, avoids internal rotation and tendency for the scope to get changed. And this is done with a 0 0.4 mm thick, 15 mm wide, and 
50 mm long uh, blade. As I said, it is a complete osteotomy. The cutting is done by keeping the blade perpendicular to the bone and then making it parallel to the ground over the anterior portion. After the osteotomy, is ruler is used to use to measure the gap and also to see that the osteotomy is complete. And then we gradually open the osteotomy by passing one and more chisels. The second chisel is passed with less than the predecessor. And we can open with a spreading bone chisel to the amount of correction which is needed. The second chisel is passed less than the previous one. And once the desired correction is achieved, uh, we open and see by the portrait method or by alignment rod. But one thing is important, we must make sure that the interior part of the osteotomy is in contact and they are parallel. Because if they are parallel, there is no change in the stroke of the tibia. If there is an inherent unstable osteotomy, one by each and proximal distal fragment is passed to make sure that there is no rotational malalignment. While opening the osteotomy, simultaneous lateral displacement of the fibrosity takes place with lateralization. For an average 10 mm distalization, there is 3 to 4 mm lateral translation. Then we measure the um, opening and then we can fine tune with the spreading chisel by seeing the uh, 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 rod, alignment rod or a pottery from the head of the femur to the ankle joint and it should pass through the Fiji Saga point for the correction. If the osteotomy orientation is not parallel to the left lateral tibial slope, this will lead to a change in slope. If the spread is put anteriorly, there is increased slope. If the spread is put posteriorly, there is a decrease in slope. And if the MCL is not released, there will be again more opening anteriorly. So these are the precautions which must be taken. The final correction is seen with full extension um, on table. If the guide wires are removed. The tomofix is prepared by putting locking head sleeves in hole A, B, and C with the help of a gliding lock. This is important because the plate, as I told you, is only 3 mm thick and the locking head screw should be perfectly locked. The two spaces are put in hole D and hole 1 to keep the osteotomy plate away. And the distal part of the plate is put by making a tunnel in the center of the tibia distally. And the plate should be put as posterior as possible to have the longest possible screws. And once we are satisfied the, with the position, the hole D and hole 1 should not overlie the osteotomy gap. And the, the one K wire, two mm K wire, it is fixed. Then we insert two locking head screws, monoparticle as long as possible in hole A, C, and B. To compress the osteot in the lateral hinge, a locking head screw is a bicortical screw is passed in the neutral position in hole one. And this is directly in the distal direction. This creates a um, suspension in the plate and creates an elastic preload, compresses the lateral hinge and brings the distal fragment close to the plate. So we must make sure that we put it in the neutral position Otherwise, the osteotomy gap will reduce. And this should be passed in 10 degrees, distally directed, the locking head is screw. Um, and then 
after the, we, we are satisfied with the uh, correction, we insert monocortical docking head screws in hole two and three. Then we replace the spacer in hole four with a monocortical screw. And after that, the docking head screw is put, which is bicortical in hole one. After we have removed the locking head, uh, after we have removed the uh, lag screw, and then the spacer from the D hole is removed, and a monocortical locking head screw is passed. So, this is the final correction. The flap which was raised is put into the gap to cover the osteotomy. And this is how it covers the osteotomy gap, and this promotes healing in this large area. The osteotomy hematoma is retained by applying a compression bandage for eight minutes. This time is utilized to check the correction uh, on the CR. Then the wound is uh, closed with a overflow drain. In the first 24 hours, patient is given analgesics and cold uh, compression and manual lymphatic drainage to decrease swelling. And we must continue to work on extension either by exercise or by CPM, whatever the facilities are available. Patient is allowed partial wound weight bearing with 10 to 20 kg weight. There's no restriction of range of movement because it's an extra articular osteotomy. There is no need of orthosis and orthosis and X-ray control is taken at two. Um, in two planes. At six feet, patient is allowed normal weight bearing and intensive muscle rehab is started weight training. Clinical evaluation is done at six weeks, three months, six months, and one year. And a plant can be removed at one, two, one and a half to two years' time. So the advantage of a bioplanar medial open osteotomy is it preserves the vitality of the uh, proximal segment. With Minimal dissection. It is an inherently stable osteotomy. Gradual opening with adequate medial duties should be done. Compression of the lateral hinge makes it more stable. And this allows a function to have in the presence of a tomorphic angle stability. This is one patient who was operated nine years back. His MPTA was 78 on, 79 on the right side and 78 on the left side. There was no joint space seen. And this is at the 13 months when the joint space is formed. He was also operated on the other side a year later. His MPTA was reduced on the right side from 91 to 91 on the right and 90 on the left. His pain is reduced from 5 to 0 0.5 on the right side and 4 to 0 on the left side. His MPTA improved from 79 to 91 on the right and 78 to 90. The range of movement and motion was increased because of the control of pain. The flexion deformity of 10 degrees was corrected uh, on the right and 5 degree on the left. This knee score and knee functional score all improved and remained so after that. So this is the video. You must concentrate on the sound when you're walking up and down. This is the age of 69. The amount of cut which you have gives an idea outgained and comfortable knee down. He could just squat on the floor. Without any problem. So any patient who has a tibia vera with knee pain on the medial side should be operated by medial compartment osteo 
uh, for medial compartment osteoarthritis knee by medial open wedge high table osteotomy. We should not close our eyes to evidence, science, and the art that surgical skill and need over the population to sit and squat on the floor for activity of daily living. Thank you for your attention. It is said, the one who works with his hand is a craftsman. The one who works with a mind is a scientist. The one who works with a heart is an artist. But the one who works with his hand, mind, and heart is a surgeon. Thank you for your attention. So, now we can have the So, uh, I wish to congratulate both uh, Mangal and Sanjay for putting forth what should be and what is the most basic form of high tibial osteotomy today, the simplest variety. Firstly, just to say a few words, there is no need to compliment Mangal because he's known all over India because he's simplified high tibial osteotomy and made it possible for first timers and beginners to use a simple fixator and to develop the confidence to perform a high tibial osteotomy, not get worried about achieving the perfect alignment on the table, which is, you know, which agree, which all we all understand is not a very easy task. And to be able to do it simply in the outpatients department, the fixator is very simple. It is not cumbersome. It is not unwieldy. It allows the patients to sleep in bed with the leg resting on the bed. It gives the patient confidence because it's minimally invasive surgery. And due to the achievement of more or less very good alignment, it gives good and consistent results. So there's much to be complemented on this method of hemicalotasis, which allows many beginning surgeons to get on with it. At the same time, I would like to compliment uh, Sanjay for highlighting the technique of medial opening wedge high tibial osteotomy using the Tomofix system. This is arguably and most understandably the widest used um, osteotomy today in the world. The literature that's present, if you read Kista and many of the other journals, especially the knee journals, 90% of the literature in the world today is devoted to medial opening wedge high tibial osteotomy. And for a good reason, because just like Mangal's fixator is, you know, very easy to use and is reproducible by many surgeons, especially the beginning ones, the Tomofix system has only a few, you know, devilish tricks up its sleeve. The instrumentation is beautiful. You can achieve correct results. You can get, you know, the patient mobilized up and early. So it has taken away many of the disadvantages. And so I compliment both of you. Thank you for making these simple techniques and popularizing these techniques. Thank you. <clears throat> Doctor. Thakkar, if you have to make your comments. Dr. Thakkar, you can unmute yourself and... Yes, sir. Uh, if there are some questions or comments. No, but I... Uh, actually, principally, I agree with Dr. Mangal Pariyar, what he has said already that it's a, uh, he, he had shown us the two cases also of ITPL osteotomy and uh, in which uh, there was a, a little overcorrection as more than it was expected. I face it very frequently in my practice doing closing wage ITPL osteotomy. And uh, as especially he stressed that uh, this cosmetic appearance is not accepted by particularly young patients. Old people will accept the uh, condition, but uh, younger patients may feel that their limb is been deshaped. And uh, if both the limbs are in excessive valgus, then there is always, because of knock knee, uh, it, uh, produce, uh, it creates some problem in walking. So uh, principally, I from the beginning, I agree with Dr. Mangal that fixator assisted is the best because here we have a chance to re uh, reduce the overcorrection also that either tomopics 
or in close wedge with internal fixation is not possible. So uh, this is the biggest advantage. But uh, somehow, particularly, I could not uh, adapt this technique because uh, since I come in contact with him, before that also I was doing close wedge. I was used to close wedge. That's why I stick it to it. In between, I did uh, open wedge high tibial osteotomy also. Yeah, even absolutely, uh, when it is absolutely indicated, I always do open wedge. That's the my uh, comments on uh, high tibial osteotomy. Thank you. Dr. Ravi Mittal. <laughs> Hello. Uh, uh, good evening, everybody. Yeah. I, I heard the both the talks and I compliment both the speakers for uh, elucidating the salient features of the astronomy by different methods. And especially there are situations where one would like to change the implant and not use the internal fixation. Uh, Am I allowed to ask some doubts? Yes. Now <clears throat> you are you are encouraged. Okay, thank to you. Ask doubts and you are encouraged to criticize also. Okay, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, if somebody has got a, a unilateral symptomatic virus deformity with osteoarthritis, and we correct by a valgus osteotomy. Uh, they are relieved of pain, but often they said this leg looks different from the other one. And at times it's difficult to explain to the patient. So uh, in such a situation, have you faced such a situation and what do you do for that? You see, if it is, uh, I would put it this way, if it is unilaterally virus, then it must be short little bit. So once you correct this, it will either equalize or maybe a little longer. Yeah. But the pain, which is the main concern, yeah. is, and osteoarthritis is usually bilateral. So once you tackle both the knees, the limb then becomes normal. For that uh, time when the other limb is not needed to be operated or is not operated, then a shoe raise can be given. Yes, I had to give shoe raise in one case. Uh, because this operated knee uh, limb was uh, longer than the this other side. Yes. Yes. And uh, the price of uh, doing any osteotomy, even if it's it's close wedge, it'll be shorter. If it's open wedge, it'll be longer. Yes, sir. That is. Sir, uh, Doctor Mangan has uh, described uh, fix uh, osteotomy using fixator and then slow correction over it. Uh, my question is, uh, can we do acute correction and put a tubular fixator? Is it okay? No, <laughs> because uh, the Tomofix, they do acute correction. Yes, sir. And it relies on uh, two things. One is the biplanar part of yes. it. So that biplanar thing is in, is in good contact. Even if you see a gap on the uh, ascending wedge, uh, the biplanar is in contact and that is uh, healing already. And second, even if that takes a little longer time, even, even if, you know, if it's partly healed, not fully healed, and it's going to take another uh, a total of maybe five or six months to become solid. But okay. the overall construct of partial healing plus the plate is stable enough for the patient to be uh, symptom free. Now that okay. will not happen with a fixator. So the fixator will tend to get uh, loose over time. The patient is not going to tolerate the fixator for uh, five months and six months. So therefore, I think uh, both of these things should not be uh, mixed up. Acute correction, I, I think you should have some form of internal implant. Whether you are doing, uh, you know, whether you are doing uh, open wedge, whether you are doing a closed wedge, the only situation where you can do acute correction with a fixator, I would say, say with an elizarop, and you do a dome correction, where you've got good stability, and you expect that this is going to heal in you know three three and a half months, by which time then the fixator can be uh, removed. But otherwise, combining the principle of <laughs> uh, tomofix open wedge with 
a jugad of external fixation i think is not not a, a good idea okay and if we don't leave the gap open we put in some bone graft and then put a fixator uh, would it be acceptable yes i i would not i i would say that's not not acceptable but that the, the issue of you know accuracy of correction again uh, comes up and a unilateral fixator no biplanar biplanar tubular fixator yeah i mean yes theoretically it it could be done but i personally i would say there is no real what do you, what would you say is the advantage of that over a re, just a regular tomo fix <laughs> now initial... if you are going to open it and if you are going to put in graft you, you need a you know reasonably big incision uh, for that right so increase that incision a little more and take all the advantages of a um, good tomo fix plate i mean even if the tomo fix itself is costly Uh, there are uh, good indian clones also available now in terms of the metallurgy and in terms of the uh, biomechanics so personally i am not so sure that there is a big advantage to using a uh, you know combining those two techniques okay uh, sir i heard your uh, talk before and your opinion regarding the procedure adding the procedure of arthroscopy during the ostomy yes now uh, if we look at the arthroscopic literature hmm they are combining root repair of the medial meniscus with sto hmm now is it a rational thought no or it, okay. to me it's not, it's not a rational thought because if you uh, look at it depends on what literature you look there is there is i forget the name i think his name is uh, n a g or something it's a korean name n g or n a g i forget exactly ng 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 yeah yeah so th- this uh, this paper looked at root tears which were treated by root repair and without root repair sto with uh, root repair yeah. sto with root repair and without root repair okay and then they went back and did a, a scopy again yeah and they found one 50% of the patients who were treated without root repair had healed just with the osteotomy yes and uh, functionally there was no difference between the patients who had a repair and who didn't have a repair or patients who were healed and patients who were not healed uh, okay. my personal experience and i'm sure milin and uh, uh, sanjay will also i think corroborate that that uh, we have seen n number of patients who come with the mri report of degenerative root tear and then we okay. correct the alignment or whatever is the uh, issue without doing a you know scopy or something like that and those patients remain symptom free the exception is a patient with an acute root repair uh, acute root tear patient mm-hmm. has been completely fine and then su- suddenly all of a day uh, one day he goes pop and feels the pain in the back of the knee and this is a young patient without established osteoarthritis but the patient has varus now that patient requires a root repair and you may consider also doing an osteotomy to uh, ensure that the root repair heals but the run of the mill 45 50 year old uh, you know medial compartment wear and then you do the when the patient comes with the mri you see a tear of the uh, root degenerative tear of the root that that really is not a candidate in my eyes for a root repair milin sanjay <clears throat> i agree if it is not mechanically interfering then probably it is not but i have very little experience of doing arthroscopy per se so i is not the right person no so that that's exactly what i'm saying how many patients that you have done have say and you have seen that the mri shows a uh, root tear and then those patients have come and come and complained back to you that oh i'm not well that's that's the point that is the root repair really required or not i say it's not yes same i i agree with i agree with mangal i completely okay. agree i have i have a uh, i have two comments to make as a, as a broader in the broader context 
firstly is within a very few minutes of us talking about osteotomies we are being invaded by these arthroscopic concepts to which i just want to bring notice to ki we get invaded what happens to the root tear what happens to meniscal tear what happens to meniscal extrusion so we have to distinguish between cause you know something that is causing the pain you have to be able to establish what is cause what is really causing the pain and uh, the mri just shows something that is present is that the cause of the pain is that the main ingredient of the pain this is yep. something we need to understand and we have been in our complex you know because arthroscopy is so very much more popular than high tibial osteotomy these people are thrusting all these concepts upon us i agree with mangal there is no there is really see what happens to me i am not a arthroscopic surgeon but i perform a patello femoral retinacular release which gives me a window to look into the medial side of the joint also a window to look into the lateral side of the joint i have frequently removed large loose bodies i have removed a extruded meniscus or a bucket handle tear or i have removed a discoid meniscus which is very clearly visible so but a root repair per se possibly it's possibly overkill okay uh, can i ask someone another question And one thing more uh, the stobley classically said uh, arthroscopy is not indicated the american okay. academy says arthroscopy in osteoarthritis has no role so there must be some truth of not doing okay osteoarthritis okay sir uh, when there is a um, deformity in tibia proximal tibia and distal femur combined and we uh, try to achieve the correct alignment by doing a tibial osteotomy only the slope of the joint tilts laterally now some time back it was considered to be bad and a distal femoral osteotomy was advocated along with hto but the recent literature says that the lateral down sloping uh, uh, joint line is not a issue and it doesn't affect the outcome of the hto uh, so how would you react to it it's true i mean uh, before our knowledge of uh, the importance of uh, looking at femoral varus uh, we've done n number of uh, cases where we have over or even today if if the tibia you know femur is uh, 90 91 and there is no lateral thrust i may think about over correcting the uh, tibia and uh, milind in fact i think in the, the last talk that he gave uh, he talked very clearly about uh, dfo and jlo and and all of that in, at quite a length the uh, my reasoning for doing the uh, double osteotomy when i do it is that uh, number one it reduces the amount of correction i need to do Uh, in the tibia, because the more you are, and especially if you are doing it with some form of internal fixation, uh, you get to open less of a wedge. But more importantly, is when I am doing this for younger patients, I know they will last for you know fifteen years, maybe twenty years. But at some point, they are likely to require a knee replacement. Now, if you are grossly overcorrected, then your cuts in the uh, for a TKR also get affected. so that that is one of the reasons uh, i do it otherwise what you say is right that a uh, 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 varus femur and a valgus tibia is supposed to be a, a good combination which protects against shear and uh, protects against further damage okay uh milin now... milin will have something to say about the jlo i mean in he his his whole i think half his talk last time was yes i heard that talk on that yeah So if i may elaborate a little this is really getting interesting because um, you know love challenges and doing the dfo properly was a challenge and it took uh, it took a few cases of the learning curve but we did it and after doing it some realizations have dawned one is as mangal was saying that the varus jlo where the medial side of the joint line is elevated and the lateral side is depressed and you have over corrected in the tibia let's say by a few degrees or somewhat more so the patient has a varus jlo so what i think i failed to emphasize because it is a long talk so how does the patient compensate this 
how does the patient compensate you have corrected the tbi okay the femur is 91 92 but you haven't done an osteotomy sanjay's patient is there he doesn't want two osteotomies my patient is there you know he doesn't have the money to pay for two high quality implants and you know we cannot do we do it on the tibia so we over and, and patient can't pay for one high quality surgeon doing two surgeries surgical cost also <laughs> <laughs> so what happens how does he compensate it's very easy he abducts the limb if so there are two issues here how to measure the jlo number one there is a mistake there is a confusion in the nomenclature so if you get the nomenclature right and if you measure the jlo right and the patient is in varus jlo because you have not touched the femur even though it's 90 92 93 94 94 etc and so he is in a varus jlo so how does he compensate think about it it's dead easy he abducts the limb by a few degrees and that varus jlo comes to neutral it's okay. easy that's the way they compensate for an osteoarthritic you know gait that's why they have a broad base gait yeah now, what that waddling we used to Only now it comes to the interesting part when we are in the beginning phase of our learning curve with the DFO. I'll tell you what happens. The patient comes to us with the 92 degrees of femoral varus, and he's got some varus in the tibia. And we feel that yeah, yeah, latest you know knowledge is that we have to perform a DFO. Now what happens? You take your saw, oscillating saw blade, or your osteotome thickness. The oscillating saw blade thickness is one and a half millimeters. Yes. The the osteotome thickness is one and a half millimeters. So the two cuts you have made for a closing wedge, they themselves are three millimeters. Now very frequently you find they have now literature says that DFO it should not be more than seven degrees. So if it's a small femur, especially if the femur is a small person, the amount of wedge that you need to resect is less than seven mm. By three mm, so your cuts are not going. So it becomes very easy to overcorrect the femur. Then what happens? Then he goes into a true valgus jello. So I showed a picture at the end of my talk, but then what happens? How does the patient compensate for a valgus jello? That's the difficult part. He has to adapt the limb while walking, which is miserable. He's miserable. So if we are to err on the side of doing less by only doing the tibia for many reasons, it's not such a crime. Okay. Now in the Indian population, if we have a varus both in the tibia and the femur. The apex or the cora lies somewhere in the diaphysis, usually. Not so, necessary. It can. It, it it could be due to a board femur, but it could also be due to a varus. Uh, like like the lady I showed, her her deformity was in the distal uh, femur. But then I have uh, other cases where they have a significant bow in the femur, which you know basically yes. causes that. So it could be either. <laughs> So, would you still do a distal femoral or a diaphyseal osteotomy and fix it? No, it, if it's uh, actually on the knee preservation group, I, I uh, uh, a few days after that discussion, I put up one where there was the lady had a clear bow. So yes. I I I did a distal femur. I mean, I put a distal femur nail and did an osteotomy at the apex, which is in the diaphysis, okay. which then got it back to sort of normal. It was I think eighty uh, nine or ninety. Which is inside the normal range, and then I did the so you know we corrected about six degrees or so of that bow. So unless you could correct it distally also, but if there is a large bow, personally I would say okay, it's you know I can correct it uh, well with with this. But uh, the small amounts you cannot with the diaphysial you cannot over correct. Yes. You cannot. With the metaphysial, even if you say that okay, the the angle is ninety one. And I want to gain a little extra, so instead of going to eighty-seven, I will try and go to eighty-five. That I can do only on the metaphyseal. That I can't do with the diaphyseal. Diaphyseal will give me only whatever the canal will allow, okay. which is usually eighty-seven, eighty-eight. Okay, sir. In the biplanar osteotomy that has been described uh, classically for tomophakes, the vertical limb uh, goes up towards the knee joint. Yes, and they say, and they say the requirement of the opening of wedge is more. You can do it inferiorly also. Yes. Now, would it be okay if, as a routine, we do only a inferior cut, not the superior cut? No, the inferior cut has got a lot of problems in terms of it's a very thin part. It's going into cortical area. 
yes. uh, there is a risk of uh, breaking that because you are doing a large correction and the way you then you have to fix that when you when you do a distal you have to fix it with uh, screws so the risk there is a definitely a risk of uh, fracture whereas the proximal is in as uh, sanjay showed is is in you know metaphyseal bone that starts healing within about uh, 3 weeks that that uh, anterior posterior healing is happening so i will certainly not suggest that routinely we should do a distal oster it should be done in in really cases where there is a problem in terms of, of correction okay thank you very much sir I have a question for uh, Sanjay. Um, Sanjay, what I have faced the problem with the Tomofix plating system. I am a very faithful adherent to the Tomofix, and I probably have done more than 150 in the TBR using the original Synthes Tomofix. The problem with the Tomofix is firstly, it's there is no chirality. They're, it's a standard plate for both the right and the left. That's number one. And in so doing, what they have done is when the plate sits very nicely on the upper tibia, what happens is that the, 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 the screws, they face posterior laterally. They face posterior laterally. And there is this indentation in the posterior part of the tibia in the center. If you're not careful, your screws can go into the, very frequently because of the, you know, the difference in the shape of the Indian patients. I wish I could pull up a diagram and show, I'll try and do that in a while if I can. But what I have to frequently do is I have to keep the plate offset from the bone. I have to keep it a little away from the bone a little bit so that my screws go more laterally rather than posterior laterally. Now, what that does is it gives me far better fixation and it allows me a good night's sleep and very good stability of the fixation. But what it does is that the plate becomes a little proud and it starts irritating the patient. Now, this has happened to me a couple of times in the past where this posterior, either, you know, make the plate sit flush on the bone and the screw, especially the posterior screw, it exits the tibia and it exits in that central zone in which the neurovascular structures are close by. And you only see it later in some x-rays, you may miss it. And I had to go down and back up the screw, back out the screw in the sense, put in a new screw, lesser by eight or 10 millimeters. So what is your experience? What, what do you feel about this? Have you come across this problem, you, Mangal, please? Uh, when I put the plate, I put it more posterior. Okay. So if you put the plate more posterior, the screws are more lateral. If you put more anterior, then they go more posterior. Okay. Okay. So the, the, the curvature of the tibia allows the screws to be placed more more, to go more in the lateral direction than in the posterior. Yes. Direction. But okay. then the same thing happens, which you are talking of that the plate, instead of sitting, you know, along flush, it tends because the anterior medial tibia is uh, kind of angled. And then the plate will sit a little uh, proud. But that is that is one of the recognized issues with the Tomofix, a prominent plate, which requires uh, removal. I think it, it, it is an issue. More often when the uh, first, the generation plates were used, which were ma made for the uh, Europeans, because the proximal uh, part was. No, that that I agree that that is you are talking of only the size of the plate. But what Milind is talking about, I don't know whether you, you are able to see the tibia is like this, and then the plate to to get it lateral, you have to fix the plate a little bit like this. So that your screws go, uh, you know, more medial lateral and not as uh, posterior. Yeah. So yes, I, I, I mean, um, I had sort of, let us say, the the privilege of of assisting Staubli in in a couple of cases in uh, Mumbai. So I I had that uh, concept, and uh, I am always very very uh, careful. So sometimes even if I go through the uh, posterior cortex a little bit i will get a feel of it so and i'm sure this is this is the case with you also that once you know about it then it doesn't happen again you know it happens a couple of times but after that <laughs> it doesn't happen so i've taken the liberty of you know sharing this photograph and you know this is this is the design and to prevent the plate from the screws from exiting posterior, forget this, this is a TCV osteotomy, but it's the same story with the MOW. 
this i have to keep the plate you know jetting out a little yeah. proud anterior yes and that, that that way i solve the problem but that way the patient is a slightly miserable they do complain and so there is an answer to this the, there is an answer to this problem and the answer has been found by the japanese several years ago they have plates for the right and the left and the the head the head part of the plate the transverse part is offset posterior they have this and uh, i think it works really like a charm plus you need to have the screw holes threaded in such a way that they face more anteriorly or the the head part of the plate is not only offset posteriorly but twisted to face in the lateral direction and that's one big big peeve with the tomofix system i have i really other than the fact that the machining is fabulous and the metallurgy and the elastic properties and the weight bearing ability is mind blowingly good but this thing is a is a bug bear that doesn't go away yes professor mittal uh, so i think the ao plate uh, was designed to have the maximum purchase of bone in the tibia and the way that they did it was uh, by directing the screws posterior laterally and in, in my initial days i also made a mistake that my screws entered the tibio fibril joint uh, which was not visible on the ap x ray and the patient complained of pain uh can you hear me yes so now i have realized that in the indian patients the north indian patient that we get putting a screw in the transverse part of the plate uh, not more than 50 solves the problem for me and if i keep the plate away from the bone to change the direction in relation to the tibia proximal part that makes the tibia very prominent especially in the ladies yeah and they start complaining of pain which is even worse than the initial pain that they had before surgery and uh, we are in a dilemma uh, that what to do with this now we can't remove the plate uh, till it heals and for two years it's a nightmare for uh, everybody so i think when we are just keep the bone uh, plate flush to the bone that stops the irritation of the skin and then stop tr- and just imagine you want to dr- drill the lateral cortex stop short of that and if you take a view a post of view in the uh, po- uh, say oblique lateral view you can you have to be sure that none of your screws are out of the cortex and you can yeah. see only in the oblique view not in the lateral view Correct. but uh, the way i understand is the whole component practically and the all should have a monocortical screws yes sir so whatever the um, longest possible you can put monocortically should be used i know but what happens is when you are you are trying to get the longest possible monocortical screw usme occasionally you you go through the uh, cortex but uh, you know if if you if you keep uh, what's the word if you keep track of of the feel also you realize okay that we we've, we've gone through the posterior cortex and then you take a, a, a screw which is shorter yeah so i don't yeah. think there's a big problem perforating the cortex but it's not it's not good to you know in the post op x ray to see that the screw is behind because then you are uh, worried but uh, i'm sure milind will agree with that that this this happens two times and three times at most yes after that then your your uh, you know senses are well aware of of what can happen and therefore then it doesn't happen again the, have a work around the other method of not perforating the opposite cortex which i have learned is that you only drill the proximal cortex rest of it you just push a little bit to the uh, uh, cancer no, there is there is that uh, woodpecker sort of method yes. drill and just push drill and push Yes. Till you reach the opposite cortex, so with that, that works pretty well. I mean, yes. and that technique works um, whether you're doing proximal uh, tibia, you're doing distal radius, anywhere you don't want the screw to go through, uh, you can use that. Uh, I don't know. I think it's called the woodpecker technique, or the yes, probably. And, and a post op, sorry. And you don't throw away the cancerous bone, which gets into the drill bit. that's another advantage interesting you just compress the cancerous bone into the hole okay okay interesting 
so a couple of a couple of issues about the medial opening wedge the you know a couple of things that i still can't get my head around uh, so i would like to ask sanjay personally number 1 and then mangal what is your you know what is your um, approach to the release of the superficial medial collateral ligament how do you deal with the release of the superficial medial collateral ligament how exactly do you do it how much do you do it i do it to the extent that the joint opens acutely you mean on the table while you are right so you do it at the end of the surgery after you opened up or first thing, first thing. The, you do it the first thing yes right um so so when 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 you do it with the plate mangal what is yeah. your take what is your take i on I, i slide a periosteum uh, right down so that it is it is lengthened just like we do in a tkr right then i do that is mainly so that i can i can move it behind enough right. to get my homans in without uh, struggling and then i'll do the uh, open wedge and i will i will feel the inside and if i feel any tightness i'll do a pie crusting a couple of cases i have not hesitated to divide it uh, completely when i was still finding it uh, tight that's at the end of your opening wedge that or? is at the end yeah that's at the end after i i have put my uh, plate in and stuff like that then the the division but okay. pie crusting and all if i am finding it difficult to open then i i, I might do the pie crusting even uh, okay. earlier and i uh, to the best of my knowledge there is there are papers which say that um, not releasing the mcl uh, can lead to paradoxically increased pressure on the medial side and a complete release of the superficial mcl has no real uh, consequence in terms of it you know you may think that it it causes a increased uh, laxity but uh, that that is not uh, so as far as the superficial mcl goes so actually my after so many years and so many years of doing these osteotomies on the upper tibia i have come to the you know little harrowing and little disturbing conclusion that it is possibly not as innocuous as we think it is and uh, the, the at the end of the surgery if we release the superficial mcl a little too liberally then we can end up getting a little more instability in the joint and this is something that i am working on trying to so the so the uh, the 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 temptation to release it excessively has to be avoided and one of the ways to permit the osteotomy so the theory is that if you don't release it then the pressure builds up inside the medial compartment yes we know that but the 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 what if we find other ways of allowing the the joint to, you know the joint to open like sanjay was saying without necessarily releasing a lot so one answer is what mangal says you release it arm mass all the soft tissues arm mass with the the pes and the superficial mcl all the way down to the periosteum a little distally and that way the integrity of the ligament remains and some laxity is and some opening is permitted without increasing the pressure but uh, i think releasing it a little liberally can have some deleterious consequences in the future and especially if the patient has had a large jlca to start with uh, that's uh, yes the, the other thing i think where it comes up is if you have uh, you know if if somebody does not recognize a pagoda tibia then the the problem in that patient really was more of instability rather than the uh, alignment and if that part is not recognized and then you try and correct it uh, with more uh, you know changing the angle then you are more likely to land up uh, with trouble but i think nine times out of 10 uh, that release and a little bit of pie, pie crusting if if required uh, works when it's very large corrections only then right so the what is the advantage of pie crusting once you have released it even after release sometimes if you've done a large correction it you know you you can't insert your finger between the uh, plate and the mcl it it, can, it gets actually uh, strangulated 
by okay. release i am talking of a digital release not not a transverse release the digital release is you see it get attached at a 5 to 6 uh, cm from the joint line yes and as you retract the uh, press you are in the bursa and from there you can uh, release it distally no yes that's what i'm saying so distal so, release will will work but if you are doing a large uh, correction then sometimes you need further uh, you know uh, release of it yeah. you you've done the distal release you've done the correction and then you put the plate in and then when i put my finger inside i'm not it the, the uh, tendon is really stretched against my uh, finger then and i will do a pie crusting and you put the plate under the uh, mcl or over it it is uh, proximally it is under and distally it is over so proximally i am straight on to the bone because i have i have put in my periosteum i have put in my homans and all of those structures are behind <laughs> distally i have the pes the, and the, the, MC. the way i would understand is if you raise the uh, popliteus from the posterior uh, border then that will protect the neurovascular structures and you can put the plate on mcl yes but to, in fact you should sanjay to get to the to get to the popliteus you have to go anterior to the mcl no that means from the the anterior edge of the anterior to mcl huh <laughs> posterior to mcl no that at least that's not the way that that uh, i do it i i go anterior to it and then and that is why i need to release it distally so that i can take it behind yes, yes. i understand dr mittal ravi, ravi has something sir if we release the mcl from the distal fragment and not do anything to the its attachment on the proximal fragment i think yes. we will have no problem because your deep mcl intact the that's superficial right. that's that superficial mcl on the proximal fragment is intact you just do the release on the distal side and not on right. the proximal side right. and uh, then you will have no problem regarding mcl we i i cut the mcl transversely at the upper border of pes and then release it superiorly along with the pes when i am doing a large deformity correction and till now i had no problems as far as mcl or the medial stability is concerned it remains the same because the attachment on the proximal fragment i don't touch it i do i cut it transversely fully so that there is no continuity of the mcl between the proximal and the distal fragment and release it from the distal fragment later and on also why you have the need to raise the pes sir because when we open it up the pes becomes very tight it doesn't allow opening and the adequate correction when it is more than 10 to 12 mm the pes becomes very very tight right so this is this is very interesting uh, professor mittal that you pointed out so that brings to the other uh, if i may with your permission and mangal and sanjay's permission come to the next part of the the doubts that fill our mind and that you know even though the even though the uh, even though most of the literature is on medial opening wedge now slowly if you look at all the new articles they are finding a lot of problems that crop up if you are going to use the medial opening wedge high tibial osteotomy and perform large corrections so uh so the the thing is we are not even talking about let's say we are not even talking about the instability and the pagoda tibia and all the stuff that i spoke about yesterday let's take an person who doesn't have those problems but we perform a large correction say 15 16 17 degrees 18 degrees now they are finding that there is in many patients it leads to excess pressure on the acl it leads to excessive pressure on the patellofemoral joint now number my question to sanjay first to mangal and to professor mittal is do you agree in theory to this number one have you come across these problems in your patients when you see them post operative please if i may have your inputs thank you i i have i won't exactly be able to say 
in very large directions, what would be the status would be? I think Mangal might have something to tell on that. No, I have almost no experience because the moment I see that there is going to be some trouble, I just go with a fixator. And if it's a really large correction, uh, then I, I would not hesitate to use an Elizabeth um, for that. So, I, I, yes, but I, and uh, second thing is, mostly my osteotomies will be below the tuberosity. So, these, these patellofemoral issues uh, should not uh, occur. I have not noticed anything when I do it with fixators, but that's because the osteotomy is uh, distal to the tuberosity. So, if, if, if I am in doubt, I will always uh, prefer uh, to go with uh, a fixator, either a monolateral or there are some of these patients, you know, who got really bad um, virus sneeze. There I will, I will not hesitate to use uh, an Elizarov. Ultimately, it, it's less trouble as far as uh, I'm concerned. Yeah, great answer. Obviously, you have solved this issue about treating large deformities you're doing in the femur and tibia as well, you're using a fixator. So you're not facing this problem. You're basically not taking on this challenge of opening a large medial opening wedge with a tomofix. But the thing is that- that, that, is, that is, that is, mujhe maar. <laughs> <laughs> no, but the, a lot of young, that's exactly that what young people should know. Uh, what, what do you feel, Sanjay, that suppose you open more than, you know, Professor Stobley has gone on the record to say that he has opened as much as 22 mm. Okay. And- That is because of the- Plate does not allow you to open more than 22. <laughs> yeah, but nee, nee. This, yeah. Is what I, this is what I showed you in the yes, yes, the distance between the D hole and the hole number one, one. hole is 26. I agree. I agree. And, I agree. If, and to have a maximum purchase, you can't go more than 22. Yeah, but if we come to the problem that we are worried about, that when you yes. open so much, what's going to happen to this so called difficulties with, let's say, let's not even talk about knee joint line orientation, let's talk about. What happens to the patella? I have an I have some experience. So first, I want to know what what do you, have you seen this? Have you experienced this? What do you feel? Uh, I of course there will be, but I have no idea. I would say I have not applied my mind or seen something of that sort. Okay, Professor Ravi, please. Uh, sir, uh, if somebody has got a medial knee pain along with the anterior knee pain, I don't operate that patient with HTO. So I preoperatively I look if there is any existing anterior knee pain, whatever the X-ray may be. So if there is existing anterior knee pain, I don't do STO. And in the my operated cases, the usual because they come late to us, they don't come early to us, and it's very difficult to when they are really uh, problematic and it's disabling for them. They agree for surgery, and usually I end up opening around 15 millimeters. Until now, that problem is not there. Anterior knee pain is not there. Obviously, some people have complained of prominent hardware uh, or incomplete relief of pain or whatever, but not the anterior knee pain. So, uh, like to you know put the cat among the pigeons. This is I don't know how many of you have seen this. Truth be told, I am finding that a vast majority of the patients who come demanding an HTO in the sense that when they finally agree to do an HTO when they are really in pain, vast majority of them. I would like, I'd like to beg to point out specifically, I'm not talking anterior knee pain. I'm talking specifically patellofemoral joint tenderness, specifically on the medial side, specifically on the lateral side. I find now vast majority of the patients have patellofemoral joint line tenderness, especially when they have these large deformities. And I'm only talking about the medial opening wedge. I'll share an example with you, a lady, only 55, I only opened nine and a half or 10 mm of wedge in her. I checked her twice, thrice, four times before surgery. She had zero patellofemoral pain. So I took the classic oblique incision, just did the tomo fix. She did wonderfully well for some time. And lo and behold, what came and bit me after four and a half years, she comes into the chamber and she starts complaining of pain. And now I look at her. I think I opened about 10 and a half to 11 mm or something, 11, 11 and a half mm if I'm recollecting right. And now she has come with patellofemoral pain. This I experienced many years ago. So even though I have this uh, 
as it is many percentage of patients come with patellofemoral tenderness and i do a release now without fail in each and every high tibial osteotomy i am doing a patellofemoral release i would like mangal to tell me what his thoughts are on this please and professor ravi and sanjay i i i uh, for academic purposes i i have been doing a uh, mri <laughs> okay. and in the mri i am not only looking at the uh, i am not only looking at the cartilage but i am also looking for the patellofemoral joint and the osteophytes right and if there are a significant osteophytes either on the patellofemoral joint or on the medial uh, side or in the notch i will uh, open that and do what i call a debridement essentially i excise all of the um, osteophytes and that that's what i was referring to in some of these patients when there is a correction open wedge to be done i will use those osteophytes into that gap and those osteophytes have got a phenomenal osteogenic potential because ultimately it is this is new bone that is being formed over there so it's full of all you know all those uh, biochem stuff so yes i will always look for these uh, particular things in all of the patients and even if it's a, a relatively small correction that i am doing with a fixator um, i will add a debridement if there are there are significant osteophytes already and with your voice we don't have your voice and how, sorry how often do you come across forget i mean yes the mri yes but actually clinically the patellofemoral tenderness and on a lateral x ray how often do you see the osteophytes of patients who are willing to undergo surgery uh meaning on the lateral i will see the upper and lower osteophytes in practically every uh, right, right. patient that is that is there so and i will correlate it with the axial uh, section and if there is a significant amount of uh, osteophyte i do not hesitate to uh, open the joint and uh, percentage of percentage of your cases in which you would do that i would say about uh, at least about 15 20% meaning 2 2 out of 10 okay and probably because my my indications are also relatively uh, extended okay you know okay thank you i don't believe i don't believe in in the classical indications and contraindications of a high tibial osteotomy great when you done done a open wedge then the patella is shifted distally uh, and laterally so does it make any difference on the patella femur there are that i i showed you that that paper by gasby who who talked about opening wedge creating a increase in patella femoral contact uh pressures and moving the contact uh, laterally so that and that is one that is one of the, and that is why they talk about uh your biplanar wedge going distal instead of proximal when you are doing large corrections no but by taking the tuberosity laterally the medial side get uh, decompressed or not yes but the lateral side gets compressed there are there are papers which which are which are looking at patellofemoral changes after a high tibial osteotomy um and they talk of an increase in patellofemoral uh, changes though they have not specifically pointed out in terms of patellofemoral uh, pain right but i i think one of the things that we have to be careful about is the kind of corrections that we do is very pretty large uh, on an average compared to uh, where they are doing it we are tending to do it more for uh, you know what we call a constitutional varus and uh, on the, in the west with a well aligned limb only the medial compartment compartment joint space reduction gives a certain amount of of varus and th that they can uh, correct so that correction and some of the corrections that we do are pretty uh, different can i hola yes uh i think one of the reasons for pain on the medial side could be hardware prominence no but what milind was talking about was patellofemoral. medial yes patellofemoral pain yes. not uh, medial See, joint I'm, line pain 
I had uh, one or two patients like that who had the plate pro prominence. They complained pain up till the distal thigh on the medial okay. side and mm -hmm. lower and the calf also. And it was tender only in the, uh, say, a medial retinaculum and the proximal tibia. So I think one of the reasons could be that. So one of, uh, the other reason could be uh, irritation of the, the that branch of the sapiness which goes from there. Yes, but in that case, we have a very pinpoint tenderness or something kind of that and uh, say a trial of uh, steroid injection in the subcutaneous plane can help. But when is the hardware prominence, it's a nightmare. Uh, uh, we just can't remove it also. We've reached 8 o'clock, Sanjay. Yeah, thank, thank you so very much. It was very interesting and more learning for us. And I thank all of you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Rishi, thank you so very much. You can stop the recording. And stop the streaming. Right. And, but before he does that, I will share my screen and... Okay. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you so very much. Thank you.